Thank you all for coming um, for our second of our game leadership series in Epic. Were there any questions from those of you who were here last week in terms of format or attendance? Anything everybody did there? Okay. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, um, Leah Jamison, a woman of many titles, but the one of which is nearest and dearest to my heart was uh, founder of the Epic's program. So please. Co founder. Co founder. Co founder. Co founder. Co founder. Thanks, Andrew. So, so thank you. I'm looking forward to this. I hope that this will be fun for all of us. I, I'm going to talk some about leadership. I'm going to talk about some of my own experiences with leadership and try to think about attributes that characterize different phases of that, try to abstract some principles out of it, maybe some, some overarching attributes that I have found to be valuable and and then to, to talk uh, to personalize it to talk about some of the things that very specifically for me um, I think were absolutely central to the various leadership roles that I've had so I'm going to get started um, and I'm going to start with a brief and rough chronology it, it's it's pretty coarse grained um, to give context and uh, this this left column um, the first the top part um, bachelor's degree, master's and PhD um, in electrical engineering and computer science. And then my first job was as a faculty member at Purdue. Um, this will come like it maybe my last job too, with the way things are going. Um, so it, originally electrical engineering, which then became electrical and computer engineering, a faculty mem member by courtesy also in the School of Engineering Education, and working through the academic ranks of assistant, associate, full professor, named professor, distinguished professor, um, and by all academic standards, a pretty linear start to wherever career. This is what it looked like. About 15 years into that, um, became the, pro the coordinator for the ECE graduate program which was probably my, my first significant leadership role in, at Purdue. I had chaired a lot of committees. Um, I found, after a while, I, I think at one time I did a count and said, okay, over 10 years I've been on 20 committees. And the alarming part, to me at least, was that on most of them at some point I ended up chairing the committees. So that maybe was saying something. Uh, but then co-founder of Epix, which absolutely was a life-changing leadership role for me. I served a short time as interim head of ECE, assistant dean for undergraduate education, and then 11 years as the dean of engineering, which, which was also a life-changing role for me. There's a parallel story that goes with this, which is as a volunteer, because while I was a faculty member and am a faculty member at Purdue, there's always been a part of what I've been doing that is involved with um, activities and organizations outside Purdue. A volunteer early on in the IEEE Signal Processing Society, which was my home technical society. Any IEEE members? No IEEE members, okay. IEEE is the professional side, global professional society for electrical, electronic, computer engineers, and several dozen related, closely related fields ultimately became president of the Signal Processing Society, um, vice president in two roles, one of technical activities for IEEE and for publications, and ultimately president of the IEEE. The, I became dean of engineering and IEEE president around the same time, which was interesting and not intentional, but coincidental. But it turned out that I think in a lot of ways it represented some coalescing of my experiences as a leader. And I characterized Epics and Dean of Engineering as life-changing president of IEEE and the volunteer roles at IEEE were life-changing as well, no question in my mind. I also threw out pretty much all that time the second set, second only in that smaller organizations and much more informal roles um, involved with both at Purdue and nationally with organizations focused on women in technology. Um, ulti ultimately becoming chair of many, I 
most of them at some time or another, women in engineering, women in computer science organizations. And if we come to today, I finished my term as dean about a year and a half ago, was on sabbatical for a year. I've been back starting this past fall in my faculty role, um, teaching, advising Epic's lab, serving on committees, um, doing a lot of mentoring at Purdue, but also outside. And on the volunteer side, active in some of the same organizations, but, but also saw some newer organizations for me to become and have time to become active in. So the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Science Foundation, Engineers Without Borders, a number of advisory committees in the US, but also globally. And so there are these, there are these two paths. If we look at this part sort of in the middle, that represents a span of a little over 25 years and a pretty wide range of leadership roles in a number of different kinds of organizations and certainly Purdue being the, the dominant one of those. So how did this happen? It, first I will, say the, I will say loudly, it was not planned. I, it has never really in my career been, okay, I'm doing this now, this is my next step, this is, what I, this is the job I want next, this is the role I want next, step by step by step. And I, I mention this because there are many, many, many very successful people who do know every step of the way. I'm shooting for that one up there and this is how you get there. And mine has been a little more fluid and freeform saying, these are good things, I'm enjoying doing them, they're happening, oh, I'm on the committee next year, I'm the chair, okay, that's okay. What I found was that I was actually good at it. I was organized just inherently, I'm organized. Um, I worked well with people. I enjoyed getting things done. And probably for me the biggest surprise was that I truly enjoyed looking at the bigger picture of, okay, this is an organization of whatever size. What's it doing now? What could it be doing? Where could we be going? Thinking about how things could be different and then working with other people to say, how do we get from here to there? And that I genuinely, truly enjoyed that. And so it, there's no question in my mind that it is part of what kept me going from step A to B to C, even though I didn't plan them in advance. But if I'm really honest about this, the only seriously planned thing in this entire picture um, is off the screen. When I was in, I think about ninth grade, I decided that when I grow up, I want to be a professor. Because if I'm a professor, I can stay in school forever. I was the first generation, first person in my family ever to go to college. And apparently sometimes when you plan things like that, knowing nothing about it, it actually turns out okay. So. If I describe this in, in a short phrase, I think of myself in a lot of cases as an accidental leader, but one who has had a great time doing it, and I hope impact in a number of different settings. And so what I want to do is talk with you, just give you some snapshots of leadership in three pretty different settings to t start to be able to think about what goes into this leadership thing? What, what makes it work? What made it work for me? What did I see that made it worth doing over and over again? And the first of those is going to be Epics. Um, at the heart, so Epics grew out of discussions one summer, a um, handful of faculty sitting around at a time when people in industry were lobbying criticisms pretty generously at engineering programs um, at universities that our students had great technical skills, they couldn't communicate, they knew nothing about working on teams, they wouldn't know a customer if they tripped over one in the hallway. If you gave them a problem, they could usually solve it, but they had little to no sense of what it was to be in a situation and say, what problem should we be solving? 
And ultimately, in a lot of careers and jobs in industry, it's like it's not just about solving the problem. It's knowing how to pick the problems to solve. And so out of that grew this idea of a fairly different academic structure. This was in the early 90s. Um, Team-based design projects. There were starting to be some capstone design courses in some majors. ECE was not one of them at Purdue or much of anywhere. Um, teams that were vertically integrated. So you could have freshmen through seniors on a team with different roles and the team sort of progressed more like a sports team than like an academic class that you could participate on the team, i.e. enroll in the class more than once in your time during your curriculum. In fact, you could enroll seven or eight times if you wanted to do that. And that, that was, in fact, you know, something incredibly new. Um, so different structure and ultimately would be working on problems that came from, in, me, in most cases, outside, not, not dreamt up by the group of faculty sitting around and saying, here's a great design problem. We should have the students work on this this year. Going elsewhere for the design problems and ultimately the aha moment that the elsewhere could actually be community because communities don't have the resources, the expertise, the money to hire engineers or to work with engineers. And so they could benefit greatly by working with students from a lot of different disciplines. And that perhaps this structure would start addressing some of these shortfalls that industry was seeing um, in engineering college graduates. And so EPIC started. Um, it was very different. And it's hard now to appreciate that, I think, because actually education has changed a lot in the past 25 years. But um, to make it work, I would say two things absolutely key. One, keeping an eye on the vision, that there is something out here that we think is worth doing. We want to make it happen. And at the same time, an excruciating attention to detail, to how is it working, what makes it work, because both of those, if you didn't have both of those, it wasn't going to happen. And if I step farther away from it and say, how did we actually make this happen? Um, the, the descriptors are non-traditional, I think, in academia. It, I think it took courage, because there were a whole lot of people saying, mm, no. My, you know, our department heads said, this is a crazy idea. But they're full professors, so we'll let them do it. What do they have to lose? Um, persistence, because there were a lot of roadblocks. There, I think there are a lot of things that, that you more or less take for granted in epics that simply didn't happen at universities, um, that you can, with approval, check out a credit card and go to Home Depot and buy things and come back. Um, there was no precedent for that at Purdue. Um, access to labs 24-7. There was no precedent for that at Purdue. Um, the question about the curriculum study structure, the multidisciplinary teams, vertical teams. And so persistence, but I would also say pers persuasiveness because a lot of talking to a lot of people to say, look, we think we just want to try it. Let us try it. We're going to be responsible. Please trust us. Um, and the confidence to keep going. Um, the other, which absolutely at the heart of this, um, collaboration. Um, it was a team effort. Um, Ed Coyle, Hank Dietz, and I were the co-founders. Um, and the collaboration was an odd sort of, what I would describe as strength in numbers. Because for as much confidence as we were trying to present to the registrar and the budget officers and the facilities people, um, we, on a lot of things, had no clue what really should come next. We didn't know what milestones should look like. We didn't know when things should be due, what form they should be due in, how do you evaluate teams. And so I, I think my best evidence that um, this required collaboration was that there were five teams in the first year. And the three of us co-advised the five teams. All three of us went to every single team Every, every week, every class, all semester, because we figured with three of us there, surely one of us would have an answer. And then we could pile on 
and we would make, our, make it through the semester and then actually have a basis to take something going forward. So a, a leadership in the sense of imagining something that doesn't exist and figuring out how do you make it happen. Second example, fairly different, um, is uh, IEEE and president, but also a series of roles, leadership roles in IEEE. And different in a lot of dimensions. First, it, I was a volunteer. This was not my day job. Um, so at the whole, t whole time I was doing IEEE, I was also doing Purdue things. Um, and professional organization, um, currently 400,000 members in 160 countries. It is the world's largest technical professional society. And probably the biggest difference in a lot of ways is that in any one role, you, see, you serve a fixed amount of time, and it's a short amount of time. So when I was president of the IEEE Signal Processing Society, um, it was a two-year term as president. IEEE president is a one-year term. You have a year as president-elect, a year as past president, so you can try to have some role and influence and do things for about a three-year window, but for each of those years, there's also the current president. And so a very constrained, from a leadership point of view, if your view of leadership is that it's more than chairing meetings and shaking hands, and there's actually a part of it that says, I would also like to do something, make something happen, do something. What I found, um, one key thing is to zero in in each of the roles. Find a, find a key challenge. Zero in on a challenge or opportunity and focus on that a lot in, you know, in, in various roles. Um, trying to break down some of the discipline silos so that perhaps computer engineers would talk to communication engineers um, so that the robotics people might talk to circuits people and how do you create those, you know, reduce the barriers to doing that. <coughs> Um, reinventing what was called a new technology directions committee to try to make IEEE more agile getting into emerging fields at the time, for example, wireless or nanotechnology. Public visibility, um, working not just with IEEE but with other national organizations and international organizations to say how do you raise the profile of professional societies, how do you raise the profile of engineers, how do you make people have a better idea what we do and the role that we play in their everyday lives. Um, and throughout all of this, some work on strategy and vision to say, do we have an overarching direction? Do we know where we're going? Can we set a direction that'll last more than the one year of a president, for, but for several years beyond that? You succeed in IEEE because of the shortness of the terms. You climb through the ranks. It is very much, you start here, you move up. Um, and what I found critical in that, mentors and champions. So working with people, but having, being in someone's court but, and having someone in your court. You work with volunteers and staff, and so um, different roles, and it's absolutely essential to respect both and to know how to work with both. Especially working with volunteers, literally, spectrum of ages, cultures, life experiences, cultural experiences, work experiences, reasons for being there. And so I, by far the most diverse in as many dimensions as you can imagine um, to say I'm working with all these people around the world, travel a lot. Um, and stepping way back, the two things that for me made a difference, one was focusing to say, we're, could we work on this? We're gonna work on this for a year or two. With, with luck, build some continuity so that the people on either side of you wanna work on that too, so you really extend how much time you have to think about getting something done. But also an openness to take advantage of this incredible mix of people and perspectives and ideas and experiences that, that effectively are in front of you every day that you do things with IEEE. And the third example, um, Dean of Engineering. So I was Dean of Engineering for 11 years. Um, much longer term, so there's not this, okay, we gotta get done now. But a lot of the other pieces, the vision, the goals, are, are really in 
in common. There's a difference because it is absolutely a leadership role, but it is also an administration and management role. So unlike being an IEEE volunteer where there are staff who are taking care of a lot of the day-to-day -day things, um, you are an administrator, you're a manager, you, you are responsible for the resources of the college, which includes financial resources, um, faculty and staff, space, fundraising, and everything that goes into making a large organization the size of the College of Engineering work. It, for me, clearly had a flow of vision, strategy, and execution. It was great to have ideas. You really, it's better if you can actually make things happen as well. But pretty constantly asking the question, where are we now? Where do we want to be? Um, engaging the College of Engineering community. So um, I think I had a vision, but what was far more important than my having a vision was working with literally hundreds of people to say, what's our shared vision? Where do we think the College of Engineering should we be going? And how do we do that? And what stake does everyone have in it? Building a leadership team, that's the picture in the upper left. Um, because there is far too much to do for one person to be able to do it. Communication, every step of the way. A lot of decision making, some big decisions. You know, how many faculty are we going to hire in the next five years? And the answer was 107, which was a big decision with big financial implications. And probably at least a dozen small decisions every day, which probably surprised me more than anything that there were decisions that had to be made every day. And the other one that came as a total surprise, head cheerleader. I mean, you are the voice, the face, the spokesperson, the image of engineering for a lot of alums, for a lot of people, especially outside the immediate campus. And on the list of things I never thought I would be was a cheerleader, but it was a fun role. Okay. So three examples. There's some things that were different about you, each of them. There are also, I think, some things that appeared almost everywhere. And this is based on my experience, because I will, we're going to talk a little bit about um, core values and what drives how you view leadership. But not everybody believes in the same thing. And I would start with vision and strategy as one of that. I, I over a lot of years of experience at, at this point, would say strategic planning is something that some people believe in. And some people decidedly do not believe in. It's like, why are we spending time developing strategy? Could we please just do things? Um, I am squarely in the believing in strategic planning because I'd rather know what I'm doing before I start doing it or why I'm doing it. But they're both viable leader, and they, they apply in different circumstances. So <coughs> these are things I found across a lot of very different kinds of leadership roles. Um, action and execution. I'm not sure that one ever is optional. If you, if you don't get anything done, then why are you doing it? Um, communication, I would say, is absolutely critical. In our fields, and I don't know to the extent how important this is in some other fields, but in engineering fields, fluent and responsible with data. Because if you are trying to create a shared vision, encourage people to think about something, make decisions about where we should go. Somebody's going to ask, what's the data look like? And being able to know what data is important, know how to present it, be responsible with how you manage the data, proved to be actually critical in a lot of situations. Um, collaboration, absolutely critical. Reciprocal re respect just across respect in as many directions as you can imagine. Consensus building, but also at some point in time in some roles, and I would say in the ones I did, the dean role particularly, eventually somebody's going to make a decision, and sometimes that's you. And you have to be able to do that. I will say I credit my dad for that, because I was really young at one point, and he was just sitting around talking and talking about his job and what he did. And he said, you know, one of the things I want you to know is that you have to be able to make decisions. I, I know what I want for dinner. Does that count? Um, but it stuck. And he meant that. And what I found is there are people who can't make decisions. They can walk around problems, 
but ultimately, if they don't have every piece of information, or even if they do, can never get comfortable with saying, we're deciding. And I thank my dad for a very, very, very long time ago saying, nope, you need to know how to do this. So um, the only way I think you do it is practice, by the way. Um, value, valuing and celebrating success. It's great to have a whole bunch of people all working in the same direction, doing creative things. But it's also really important every once in a while to pause and celebrate those successes because we all need encouragement. And commitment and passion because these are big jobs. And if you don't love what you're doing, it's pretty hard to do it for 11 years or even three years or Epix has been going for 24 years now, 24, yeah, coming up on 24. So just two things to wrap up and then let's talk. Um, there are a lot of models of leadership and one of the questions I've been asked probably more than almost anything is what model of leadership do you follow? What do you believe in? And when I started, I had no model of leadership because it was all accidental, and so I hadn't studied any of this. Um, Frank Green is a Purdue alum. He got his master's in electrical engineering in 1962. He was a serial entrepreneur, um, founding partner of New Vista Capital, which invested primarily in businesses owned by women and underrepresented minorities. In 2001, he was identified as one of the 25 most influential blacks in technology. He was elected to the Silicon Valley um, Engineering Hall of Fame, created programs for um, inner city kids, mostly in San Jose, um, both around K-12 science, engineering, and math, and also around leadership development for kids. And I got to know him because he stayed in touch with Purdue and actually one time, a very long time ago, he came and gave a lecture at 4.30 on a Monday afternoon um, in Epics about leadership. And he talked about this model called VRE, which was vision, relationships, and execution. And it's like, well, that's really simple. And ever since then, I have not found it to fail me, and I have found there are other pieces. You can go layers deeper. But at the end of the day, those three things capture for me what do you really need to be paying attention to when you think about leadership. And so um, there is some continuity over time that just sort of happens. Um, so what I want to end with is another piece that is stepping really much farther back. Is, and it's, it's what, what is not so much driven me, but guided me through these leadership roles. Um, and this actually also comes from something in my background, but this time my research background. Um, so my research has been um, in a couple things, parallel algorithms and software, but also speech processing, so speech recognition in particular, and have had a collaboration um, for a while with David McNeil, who was a linguistics theorist at the University of Chicago. And we were working on signal processing, and he was lurking on this sort of deep thing about how do people deal with language, and how does language interfect, intersect with the meanings with what we were trying to do, which is what are the sounds doing. And he talked really eloquently about growth point theory, which said that when you are communicating, no matter what modes you're using, so you may be communicating using speech, you may be gesturing, you may be using your body, you may be um, pointing, there are any number of ways that you can be engaging various senses to communicate. All of those sensory manifestations all come from a central core growth point that's rooted in what it is you are intending to communicate um, by whatever means you're using. And it means that if you want you can say one thing and gesture in a way that's completely counterintuitive. Try it. It's hard. Um, because the way our, our nervous system works, these things are tied together. And so for me, this has actually come to be a good encapsulation of what I would say were, were growth point values that kept me grounded as a leader. Um, I had never